Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's very special Modern Sales Pros Conversation. Today, we have a panel focused on an issue near and dear to the team at MSP and super, super important for the sales and revenue leadership community at large. Today, we'll be joined by three amazing, amazing women who are in crazy revenue leadership positions. And today they're gonna to be having a guided conversation about the role of and how to make sales and revenue leadership a more accessible, inclusive discipline for the women in our lives. Uh, today's event, really, really grateful to Amy, Jill and Mel, they're going to get a chance to introduce themselves in a few minutes, but really, really grateful for them taking some time today to share their expertise and their honest perspective on what it's like and how we can create a more inclusive environment. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, today's event is hosted by the team at Modern Sales Pros. Modern Sales Pros is the world's largest revenue leadership community. Our mission is to create an environment for our community members to answer questions they'd otherwise struggle to solve on their own. We do that through pulling together thought-provoking panels like what you'll hear today, through robust online discussion through our forum, and once it's safe, uh, in-person events. We have 22,000 members and growing, and one of the great parts about the community is it's free. So for those of you who aren't members, you'll be invited to join afterwards. And today's session wouldn't be possible without the partnership of the teams at SalesLoft and Spiff. Their partnership enables us to bring conversations to the fore that might be a little bit uncomfortable. Our mission with all diversity, equality, inclusion initiatives at Modern Sales Pros is to be honest that we don't even have maybe all the questions, let alone all the answers. But that's not going to stop us from asking. I'm really, really excited today to hand off uh, the moderation and the MC duties to Amy Volus. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet Amy Volus through my work with Modern Sales Pros. She's one of the best and the brightest, an exemplar of what it means to be modern sales. And she is a most valuable member in the community and she'll be handling moderation duties today. I'll be hopping off here in a second, but I wanted to again, thank Amy, Jill and Mel for their time today. And I look forward to hearing their conversation. Amy, thank you and I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Richard and team MSP. You have such a near and dear spot in my heart and I'm proud to be included in this discussion. Um, it's gonna be hard for me to just moderate and not jump right on in, but we have a powerhouse lineup here between Jill and Mel. And uh, from my point of view, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Avenue Talent Partners. And we are committed to helping our ecosystem and our community get better through something that I find to be quite critical um, through hiring sales leaders and uh, CS leaders. And so, that's something that we're committed to. That's probably gonna be something that we touch on a little bit here about how do we um, elevate our fellow ladies in this community. And uh, without further ado, uh, Jill, you are here and I cannot see you. Now I can see you, sorry. Um, I'm Zoom illiterate, so here we go. I'm gonna let each person do their own introduction because the last thing you want me to do is do it for you clearly, uh, not my strength. So Jill, welcome. You don't, to, you don't want to try to pronounce my last name. Um, so <laughs> thanks, Amy. I mean, I do, but that would be a bigger <laughs> thing. So there's that. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, Jill Chiara. I am the CRO of MetaCX and um, uh, been in sales for uh, 25 plus years um, and sales management. Um, in the past five years, really focused on software sales or SaaS sales, um, you know, at companies like Drift, Crimson Hexagon. And prior to that, most of my career was managing the data business at Forrester Research. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Mel, Filet. I think I'm saying it right. Is it Filet? 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 Right. Well, if you say it in French, it's Filet, but it's oh. Filet in English, so you got it right. <laughs> Uh, Swiss origins, you probably wouldn't know by my accent, but grew up in Switzerland 15 years. Um, hey, great to, uh, to have everyone listening in today. Thanks again for the opportunity. I'm Melanie Filet, uh, CEO and co-founder of Speckit. We're a modern 
uh, digital enablement solution really designed to make it easy for employees to find the information they need, learn their tools, et cetera, to be as productive as possible. Um, and my background was actually more on the operations side. So I used to lead business operations, which included both systems and tool training and implementation. So running things like Salesforce, as well as all the enablement and training. So I worked really closely with sales teams, but actually my first sales role was at Speckit. Um, so I don't have a long standing background in sales. Uh, that said, I've worked in very male dominated industries before my background in uh, financial services, real estate. Um, so definitely know what it feels like to be that person on the sales floor that's uh, the only woman on the floor uh, and, and just the challenges that come with that. And then now that I'm, you know, in B2B software in our broad, broad category, there are very, very few uh, women uh, co-founders or even less CEOs. There's like three across like eight massive categories of software um, that we're kind of tangentially in. And then, um, you know, starting spec and I ended up having to learn sales from scratch. So, you know, I closed our first 40 customers, had no background in sales. And so, and our customers aren't just SMB, some of them were enterprise. And so had to learn those motions, got a lot of coaching and mentoring along the way, and now really focused on creating a different kind of sales org um, that has diversity from the start. So really excited for this conversation here. We have a lot to talk about. And, and I read an article from HBR, HBR, excuse me, of why women are the future of B2B sales. And there's something that I think really is, is nice about the article. There's so many things that are nice about the article, but this really stood out to me. And I think it's a great place for us to start uh, this discussion. Although women make up just over half of the college educated workforce, they hold less than one third of B2B sales jobs. Mm -hmm. So that screamed to me that this is an important conversation. This isn't just lip service. And one of the things that I'm excited about with both of you is the fact that when we did the prep call, we committed to trying to make this as actionable as possible. We were getting caught up in our stories. I have been in sales for 25 years myself. I've sold over a hundred million dollars in revenue, um, but there's lots of stories that we can all share. And Mel, you did such a good job of raising your hand and being like, we can talk about this, but how do we make it better? Let's keep this actionable. So that said, uh, Jill, I'd love to start with you and your thoughts around why is it beneficial, forget about that we're three women, right, but why is it been beneficial to have strong female mentors, leaders, coaches, founders, um, founders that stumbled into sales? Why is this an important thing from your vantage point? Yeah, um, and, and it's hard to find them, first of all, um, so we want to talk about how to do that. Um, but you, you need to see people that you can relate to and you need, and women can relate to other women because of, uh, our nature, right? The, the, the way we're built, the things we go through in life, you know, ha having children, um, raising families, um, and, and also just in general, um, experiences in general that are gender specific. And when you're working and you only see men in the positions above you, you don't know how you, you try to start imitating them and it doesn't feel natural and it doesn't feel right. And so we need women to help us understand how to become leaders. Um, it needs to be much more familiar. We need to stop doing the things that we do to look like men and act like men in thinking that that's what we need to do to get to leadership positions. So I think that's the, the, the largest struggle is there are so few women in senior positions and, um, but yet those women who are in senior positions need to show other women the way. And, and that's the big gap right now, in my opinion. So show, not just tell and, and, Mel, when we were doing our prep, you were talking about some of the stuff that Jill just described where you were saying even the way that you were dressing, and I don't want to take your story away from you, but I think it's such a great way for you to chime in on this because you've, you, you lived that you did some of that. And I think you're such a powerhouse that I was so stunned. I was like, wait, what? So if you, I think this is a great way to kind of weave you in and um, I know you want to keep it actionable. So that story really stood out to me and then you fixed it. And I think that's where part of making this actionable 
starts to materialize. Yeah, and trying to figure out like where to where to kind of start based on what you said. But you know, again, my background was in real estate finance. Like I had my series seven and sixty three, like very much a male dominated industry, and you know everyone around me were, were men. And so just the topics of the conversation, but also what we did after work, right. Um, in terms of happy hours, et cetera. And I realized that like my style, like my, like my personal style ended up being very, I wouldn't say masculine per se, but I dressed a lot in black and in gray. I wore more like blazers and pants versus colors. And, you know, I said it right before we got on a call, like I went to high school in the Bahamas. Like I love colors. I love bright. I love feeling feminine. And frankly, like I just had lost touch of some of that femininity um, in my style. And it wasn't until I was actually, and this reflected in everything. Like I would go back in my emails and like remove the smiley face and just like make sure that it was just very much like what everyone around me looked like. Right. And when I started the company, I had phenomenal mentors, but they were all men. Right. Like I, and I didn't have examples to point to, like, there's a lot of female founders and more like a B2C um, fields, you know, like the founder of Away and Stitch Fix and Bumble, but there wasn't a lot of like women in enterprise software that I could like look at and be like, oh, I want to be just like this one, right? Like, I want to be just like this person. And so all of my mentors who are, by the way, phenomenal, they were all men. And so their style, their confidence, their nature is what I was trying to kind of I guess, embody, and it just didn't fully feel natural to me. And I didn't quite realize it, frankly, up until I was at a uh, conference in Vegas, a sales conference. It was a sales 3.0 conference. And I went there because one, was not being very successful in sales. Uh, and so I was like, I can probably learn a thing or two. Two, a lot of our buyers are there, right? Sales enablement, sales operations. I was like, this is a good way to kind of do that market research. And I was standing at a table there was like eight other men uh, in sales, actually, Mario, I'm blanking on his name in sales, you probably know him, from, from uh, Mangrosa was there and a couple others. And this one guy kind of like pulls me aside and he's like, hey, like, are you open to like me kind of share my observations? I'm like, sure. And he's like, you know, I'm noticing that you're kind of really like leading with your masculine, right? Confidence and assertion and like having that voice and being, you know, very much like that. He's like, but I sense this strong feminine energy that you're suppressing in the way that you're dressing and stuff. And turns out he's a coach. He's actually my coach still today. And he's had a huge impact on my life, but he really like just brought that awareness to me that like, I was trying so hard to fit in to what everyone else around me looked like, how they dress, how they just, how they laughed, how they joked, how they communicated that I kind of lost that sense of self. And so, you know, I've been kind of on that journey over the last two years, which is like, what is my style in, in sales? Right. And like, really going back to leading with like that, you know, like asking really good questions and leading with curiosity and authenticity and some of these traits that are, you know, more associated for lack of better words with the feminine. And honestly, I mean, it's been a game changer in my ability to be effective and have real connections. And, and I care about people's personal lives, right? That's not something that everyone might lead with, but I do. And I don't know if that's a woman thing. I don't know if that's my thing, but I think, you know, other than just the, the masculine versus feminine, I think like for me, the biggest lesson that I've really started shifting to is like, how do you get back to like your way of doing things and like yourself? And now I don't remove the smiley face, even though I'm speaking to a high level executive, right? It's like, how do I make sure that like, I know I should excuse my language so that I can always have like the highest quality and level of a conversation, but ultimately like it's my way of doing things. And so it's kind of been a journey that I'm still on and that like, I want to make sure that I'm a good you know, reflection for our sales team that we're bringing on board that is, you know, pretty diverse so far. So you mentioned something important about that last, all of it's important. And that last sentence was, well, I'm thinking about this from your lens. You're an executive leader. This is your company. You're at the helm. And it starts, I think, with us, right? And, and a question came up through the comments that I think is a good place to round out that last sentence of how do we bring more people in, right? And, and we're speaking about women specifically today, but this is a real question that comes up pretty much every day in my world. It's got to come up with both of you. Oh, yeah. um, you both are in capacities of hiring. This is the question. I'm a VP of sales leading around 40 individuals. One area I struggle with is hiring and sourcing great new business female sellers. We have built relationships with female sales communities and focus on developing female entry-level sales development reps and trying to pad them into account executives, but it just isn't becoming a sustainable system. 
We can certainly consistently source amazing female relationship managers, consultants, and support roles. But we haven't cracked the new business female sourcing secret. Thoughts. This comes up all the time, and it really rounds out that last statement that you made, Mel. Jill, you're a CRO. You've got a big old team. It's about to get bigger. Um, and Mel, you're growing, and your team is growing and getting bigger. How are both of you thinking about this to crack that female sourcing secret, not just for CS, not just for support roles, um, but you know, enterprise sales, where the big boys hang out, all of that. How are both of you thinking about that? Yeah, and oh God, this this will take us through the top of the hour. Um, <laughs> but so let me comment and add on, and then also talk talk to folks about what I'm doing. So uh, my very first individual contributor sales role, I was on a team of 18 men and me. Um, and you can't even imagine what happened and 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 what I went through. <laughs> You know, back to what Mel was saying, I tried to be like them and like we were playing like football in the hallways and stuff like that. And I think, um, you know, I was trying to learn the language of sports and, you know, hang with the guys and um, chug the beers and do the shots. And I felt, you know, I was half their size as well. Um, and you do, you eventually realize like, what the hell am I doing? I do not need to do this to be successful, but I see a lot of other women who just don't even want to like be a part of that because of this bro type culture. And that still exists. And by the way, that was 25 years ago, right? Fast forward to two years ago, I led a team at a very fast growing sales, um, company and I had, 14 men on my team. And it took forever for us to bring in female sales folks. And so I did my utmost and I interviewed and interviewed and interviewed and I just couldn't find the right candidate. Um, but I pursued and I persisted and I gave up some revenue, right? Because it took me longer to get female sales folks in the door and I had still carried the quota. So um, I stood by it and I was in a luxury position to be able to stand by it and say, my next two hires are going to be females no matter what. And it took a lot longer, but we did it. And you have to look at different candidates as well. You can't just look at women who have sold SaaS for many years. Or another big thing is referrals. So tons of companies have referrals, but it's all these, you know, similar aged guys doing similar things who are referring in their friends. So this just perpetuates. What I think you should do is referrals for diversity. Don't do referrals for your buddies that you worked with in past jobs or who you went to college with and they pursued a sales role in another company and you want to bring them over to yours now. Um, so, so if you have the luxury of waiting a little bit extra, do it and look for those, those individuals. Force referrals to be on diverse, you know, diverse candidates, not just people who look just like the person referring. Or them. double or triple the referrals for that. Exactly. That was one of the things I was gonna make. Like if you, Absolutely. it's still gonna be way more cost effective than any other option. Like double or triple that referral. Like, hey, bring in a woman, bring in a person of color, like make it a point. And like, but that needs to start with like the executive team, the leadership and like make that a point to exactly. actually like, that's absolutely right. And there's like good math behind it that it makes sense, right? More diverse teams um, do better. Um, and so it's not group think. You don't have group think going on all the time. So, and then the other thing is like just today, someone sent me a resume and because I'm hiring an SDR. And she said this, this, my recruiter said, Jill, this woman doesn't have um, any sales background, but she's trying to transition out of an English teaching job um, she's an excellent writer. She's an excellent communicator and she wants to get into sales. Will you entertain her for an SDR role? I'm like, absolutely. Um, because I'm thinking like this woman can write and communicate, right? And um, why wouldn't I think about you? Know, we've got to give women a shot somewhere. 
And, and so I thought, well, here's the way I'm going to try to do this. Now, we'll see if it works out, but those are the types of things you can do. Um, and it's still perpetuating though. So like, why do women give up through this process? Um, and we all know it's, it, there's a culture that women just want to like, forget about it. I don't want to do it. But women, just as much as men leaders need to change that culture and need to coach their teams on that culture. Um, one more quick story, and I want to turn to Mel, but you know, when I was managing this team just a couple of years ago, mostly men, I really, really enjoyed them, right? But they were very bro -y, very bro -y. I can't even tell you some of the things they did and said. But when I was in a pipeline meeting, this one guy kept referring to his prospect, who was a VP at a very senior public company, as a chick. And he said, you know, well, this chick said this, and then this chick said, chick said that, and blah, blah, blah. And I just, I kind of closed my book, and I was like, do you know what a chick is? And he's like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, a chick is a baby chicken. When did, when do you, what would make you think that that's a compliment to give a woman? Or why would you ever call a woman a chick? He goes, well, Jill, that's a very common thing to call someone. I said, it's degrading. And he goes, really? I thought that was kind of like women like to be called chicks. And so at that, I mean, we had this very kind of like, I wasn't trying to berate him. But we had this very open conversation. I said, no, don't, don't refer to your, do not refer to your customers or your prospects as chicks. And I know it's just between us. You're not calling her that, but your colleagues are hearing you use this word. And that's not professional. That's not you doing any job, doing you any good if you want to be considered a professional salesperson. So sometimes it's just having that conversation to make people a little bit more aware. And it's, a, it's kind of a silly example, but he actually was enlightened during that conversation. Well, if I may add, Mel, before you, you uh, weigh in here, words matter, right? Mm -hmm. And um, our vernacular, uh, the written word. And, and I think it goes back to before you even start the hiring process, before you even initiate a referral program, because if your mindset, you and I talked about this behind the scenes in the chick story, Jill, um, unless you feel that it matters, that feedback doesn't matter to me unless I realize why it matters. And so I think it's really important to understand why those words matter. So for example, I talked to plenty of male sales leaders that are like, we want to hire D1 athletes. And do you know how many other people that you turn off as a result of that? And is that really what it takes to be successful, especially if we're talking about enterprise sellers that have 15 years of experience, they may have not touched a football in 15 years. Maybe they have a beer gut and <laughs> they're not even thinking about that. They watch football on a, on a Sunday night. So yeah. words matter and some actionable things for our leaders that are joining us that are thinking about this. One, there is a free gender decoder tool. When you're writing job descriptions, you put it through that and it calls things out. There are tools like Textio and Tap Recruit. Those are also things when it comes to words that you use. And the studies show, and I'm going to I'm going to botch up what the stat is, but women, we will not apply to a job unless we feel a hundred percent. And I do know that stat, a hundred percent confident of all the requirements. We want to get it perfect. Men, it's like I want to say it's like fifty percent or less. They'll just go for it. And so if we're constructing job descriptions, I find that most people will just rip off somebody else's job description, put it up because that looks cool. And they're not thinking intentionally about the work, about the opportunity. And the one thing that I would say to the sales leader that asked that phenomenal question is, if you want to hire an experienced enterprise seller, 78.3% of people in sales are men, not women not anybody else. And so it's going to start with some of the things that Jill is talking about. How do we give them an opportunity, a shot to get into sales? How do we then train them, support them, keep them in the things to listen to the words that are important to them? Maybe they're not important to you because we speak different languages, but how are we giving them opportunities that aren't wrong? Meaning, if you're not talking about sports, if you're not talking about crushing quota 
and somebody is trying to get into sales because they care about it doesn't mean that they're bad. Doesn't mean that they don't have fire in their belly or gumption. They just might display differently. So Mel, I'm going to turn it over to you because that was me just being on the panel, not even moderating, but I couldn't help myself. Could not help myself. Richard, thank you for the 50%. So um, how do you think about bringing ladies in, supporting them, elevating them and realizing I, I bet you have some stories, my friend, that we'll have to talk about at a different time, having your series six. I, I just can't even imagine what that life is like, right? Because it is so male dominated, but here you are and there you were and you thrived and then you took a, a turn. That's a journey. So when you think about that now as a leader and helping other ladies replicate the same, what are some things that you're thinking about that work really well? Yeah, so one, I mean, you guys already mentioned a few of the things that, that are top of mind for me, but we're actually, so one thing I'll say is like, it's a lot easier at 40 sales reps than it is at 80 to solve the problem. And it's a lot easier at, you know, four or five sales reps than at 40. So the first thing is like, if you're in a sales leadership role, like there's never been a better time to start than now. And like, part of that is just like a matter of putting your foot down. And so I can share right now, like we've actually been dealing with this exact same challenge, right? We're a female founded company and we've got now five male account executives. We've got all SDRs and like, and we have interviewed, we have tried, but would I say we've tried hard enough and we've made it like an absolute point? No, right? And like, if I'm not making that a point, then how can I expect other people to do that, right? And I'm sharing this honestly, because it's something that is very top of mind. And so Last week, I actually emailed our head of HR and into our VP of sales, who's also made this big focus. And we do have diversity on the team, which is exciting um, in terms of like color, but we don't have any women. Um, and I reached out, I was like, listen, at the end of the day, like, I don't want us to use the same excuse that I'm seeing that VCs use as their excuse, because 2% of funding goes to women. And the whole reason they give is that like, everyone knows in Silicon Valley, you can't just like send a note to a VC and be like, Hey, here's my pitch. Let me meet with you. It's all referral based. And guess what? If 98% of funding is going to men, all the referrals they're getting to your point, Jill earlier are all men, male referrals. And so it's really hard for a woman to get in front and then their style is different, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, it comes down to a sourcing problem right? How are they actively sourcing and what metrics are they putting in place to ensure that they're for every man that they, you know, see a pitch for, they're seeing as much women. And just like there's stats, like you were just mentioning, Amy, there's a ton of stats that like using dots and like data-driven stats that show that like they spend way more scrutiny on like metrics and et cetera, et cetera, that like female founders have versus men. So there's like a ton of like unconscious bias happening. But what we can control is like, what are those social seed metrics? So I emailed Courtney, our, our head of recruiting. I was like, hey, I don't know if this has been done before, but could we put in place basically like a, an internal goal that like for every individual that we interview that's a male, we have to interview a, a woman, right? And like, that is like the bare minimum. Like we are just like, from a sourcing standpoint, like we are making sure that our pipeline is filled with the right amount of diversity. And in order to fill that pipeline, right, what are we doing? To your point, Jill, we are actually increasing the referral bonus for diverse referrals. We're also making sure that, you know, at the end of the day, like, yes, 78% are men, 22% by your numbers are women. There are enough women out there. It's just a matter of like, are you getting in front of them? So yes, it might be more expensive and not make financial sense to hire someone like Amy for your typical SMB or mid-market rep. But if you are trying to actually make this a point and communicate that to your team, like hire sourcers out there that can go and make it their only goal is to source this kind of individual, right? Like it is a financial investment, but at the end of the day, like that is something that at the leadership level, you need to decide to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say like one, like I just think, and I'm also guilty of it, like it's easy to make excuses as to why it's not possible. It's a matter of like you actually putting those measures in place to, to make it a priority. Um, and there's unfortunately some cost to that, but I think ultimately it makes a huge difference. And to your point, Jill, there's a ton of stats that show that like women drive more revenue. Um, the second piece in terms of like what I'm personally doing, like we are investing in coaching pretty early on as a company, like a lot of companies invest in like executive coaching for their leaders. I've been working for the last two years with this phenomenal program that I actually met through my coach, Abundant. They work with Square and quite a few other of the top um, 
software companies and I'm bringing them in house and every single account executive on our team is going to be getting this coach and we're going to do these immersions and do all that. And the big, like they're really trying to commute, like create the next generation of leaders. And it's all built on vulnerability, authenticity, and like really bringing your full self to work, which I think women are generally speaking more comfortable with. And like just, we've only had two AEs go through the program so far, but seeing the way that it's opened them up and created just like a completely different dynamic on the team, bringing in like that openness. I think like if we're able to change that bro culture into more of that, like, hey, let's like execute at the highest level and let's do whatever it takes to become the best versions of ourselves and like sell at the highest level, but also like be open and like show that vulnerability, show that authenticity, talk about our personal challenges in a way that I think a lot of male only teams might not feel as comfortable. I think like those are the kinds of things that like by injecting that into our culture early on, I'm hoping that we're going to create a more open culture as we scale. So those are kind of the things that I'm like thinking about right now. And then we just started like a channel on Slack for all of our, um, all the women in spec it, it's about 50, 50 right now. And like, I'm sharing podcasts where I think I listened to a phenomenal podcast by Brene Brown with Melinda Gates. And it was all about this topic actually. Um, and so I'll share that. So whenever I read something, whenever I listen to something and, and now other team members there as well, we're sharing that. So just trying to make it a more inclusive culture that like talks about this. Cause I think that's one of the challenges too. Like we just don't talk about this enough. And that's definitely what I felt firsthand, it, you know, especially a little bit earlier in my career. Um, so I'm just trying to make it like just conversation. Like it's, it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not a question of pointing fingers. It's just like, hey, let's just talk about the obvious and figure out like, how can we be a reflection of that change um, in as many ways as possible? So there's a few things. There's a question about inclusion in the hiring process. But before we get to that, um, I love your opinions because it's going to dovetail into inclusion in the hiring process. When I think about VCs, not all, I love, I love me some VCs and the ones that I work with care about this stuff. The ones that I don't are growth at any cost. And that's the problem, right? You get money and now you've got to deliver and ain't nobody got time for this. And, and that's the real, right? That is the reality of what we see. And to your point, Mel, 2%, right? 2% on the funding side. That is messed up. Different story, different day. Um, but, you know, so you think about where it starts. And I think this is important to bring up the root. And it's, this isn't pointing fingers to VCs. It also starts with bootstrapped founders. It also starts with old school sales leaders that, and I will, here's my true story. I talked to a CRO recently that kept saying, my guys, my guys, my guys, my guys, my guys. Now I'm a smart ass that isn't afraid to use her voice and never has been. And I said, so I have to ask you, what about our gals? And there's going to be, so this is where we go. What is MSP, whatever the like explicit code on, on this, <laughs> um, whatever that disclaimer is, but this is verbatim. We were talking and and the COO was a woman. So I've got CRO man, he's got two women, me, founder, COO. And he said, cover your ears, ladies. I don't give a shit about diversity. I give a shit about hiring the right person for the job. So I wanna, do, I wanna combine some of these things of inclusion in the hiring process where there is this misnomer of shutting down of the numbers aren't on my side and I am looking for experienced hires and I don't have a pool to draw from. That's a true story. I don't argue that. I have those conversations every day when I get the order that says, just give me some women and some people of color. And I'm like, what? Wait, this is ridiculous. So when I'm thinking about inclusion in the hiring process and I'm thinking about that mindset, the natural mindset of, doesn't matter, just get the right person for the job. I don't care about any of this. I care about the business. And then you have the growth at any cost pressure cooker, which is a reality, especially when you're taking on somebody else's money. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you guys the hard question here because the, it, it all, it got me thinking when I was looking at inclusion in the hiring process, how do we really solve for that? What are the things that we look for? What's the narrative to try to change some of this? Oh my God. I know, um, I can like a wrecking ball with some hard stuff. <laughs> um, okay, well, I hope this doesn't sound like a cop-out, but it's everyone's problem. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's where I would start. It's, 
you know, the uh, sales line managers, it's the, the sales VPs, it's the CROs, it's the CEOs, it's the investors. Everyone has to take responsibility for it. And, and again, if they look at the statistics, it, it behooves them to do that. And so at the end of the day, they have to stop making excuses about the difficulty and suck it up and do the right thing for their business and ultimately for diversity, but also for their business and their revenue. So, you know, I think it's these excuses that people keep using and you can get around it. And it's just as much a male issue as it is a female issue. Um, and I've seen a, plenty of men um, tackle this issue head on and do it really well. And, you know, I've tackled it in my current role as well. Um, so it's possible. It, and you, you, you have, so as women, we feel it a little bit more on a day-to-day -day basis. So we feel more responsible to deal with it. But if you bring, you know, I report into a male, if I bring him into my feelings around this and justify why this is important to me and his company, he will then feel it as well. So I think we've just got to, the, the excuse making has to stop and we have to start making everyone accountable. But how do you do it? So Mel, to you as, as a founder, right? How do you do that? So like, it's one thing to say it and I'm not coming for you, Jill. I love you. You know this. But oh, yeah. it's, it's easy to say that, right? It's easy, like it's all of our problem, but then people don't know what to do with that problem. And so Mel, how are you, you are a female founder, you have money behind you from VC, that, that's hard, 2%, right? How, and it starts, I think it's, whether you're male, female, I don't care who you are, but I think it starts there. How are you developing a more inclusive hiring process that we've all agreed is slower in a world of you got to grow. Yeah. That's a hard conundrum. So if you could break that down a little bit, I feel like that would be really helpful for folks that are joining us today. Yeah. So I'll start by saying like, I agree with you, Jill, like it is everyone's problem. And like, we've talked a lot about leadership. I think also like if you're an individual contributor, like how I rose real fast in my last company is because I was like the bottom of the totem pole but I said, I would literally ask for time with our CEO and like say the things that no one else was willing to say, not necessarily about diversity, but across like everything else. And like in three years, I was our chief of staff, right? And like, basically like all that to say that like, if you're an individual contributor listening in, like, yes, your VP of sales should be leading the charge. Yes, your sales manager. Yes, your CRO. Yes, your CEO. And it should start from the top and trickle down. But like, ask them, hey, I'm noticing a lot of guys. Are we going to bring a girl to the team anytime soon? Right. And like, just start asking questions, obviously phrase them in a little bit more eloquently, but like, don't be afraid to like question your leadership and like bring, bring that to attention and make it a point of conversation because sometimes that's all it takes to like really raise the alarm bells at the leadership level because now it's become a topic of conversation. So just one small detail to add there in terms of like what I think is in my control, I think there's a misconception that like as a founder, you don't choose your investors. And like, to your point, like, oh, my investors are telling me this. And it's really easy. I think it's, it's a cop out, frankly, that a lot of CEOs and founders say, it's just like, oh, my investors want us to grow at all costs. Because I can say like, we've been fortunate to be able to have a choice of our investors, but like, it's been a priority of mine to find investors that value the same things as I value, right? And a big piece of that is, for example, like we recently just went through a fundraising process and now like, we have three female investors and one male investor, right? Was I looking for female investors? No, but was that something that like aligned really well? Yes, right? One of our female investors, um, and it's actually a group of women, Malin and Layla are the operator collective and they're all about getting more women into investing. And Layla like fought for the fight of equal pay at Salesforce. Like she has a whole chapter in Mark Benioff's book because she was the highest female paid executive there and noticed that, women weren't getting equal pay. And so she led the fight, made it, Mark Benioff in one, like, I think it's like one day, like made a $16 million check just to get women making the same amount of money and kind of led that path in Silicon Valley. And so to me, like going back and I saw a question earlier, how do you select your mentors? I'm like, 
that is who I want to learn from, right? If that is the person that's on my board and it's helping me drive decisions as a business, I know that it's not going to be, hey, grow at all costs and like forget what I just spent like my whole career building off of do this, right? And so every single board meeting, we talk about like our hiring plan, our diversity, we talk about our leadership, we talk about AEs, and that's why it's like such a priority for us. And so one, like get people on your board and on your side that actually care both on your advisors as well as like on your board. I think if you're a founder listening in, um, and then again, like at the end of the day, like I can blame everything else as to why we have right now five male account executives and no woman, but who's the final person approving those hires? It's me. Right. And there's a certain point that I think like as a leader, like you need to take responsibility for the fact that like you did not make it a point to stop that from happening. And that's why like last week after we hired our last account executive, I'm like, okay, we need to make sure that like, like it's no longer an option. Like I've always heard the phrase, like, if you're about us page looks like a rainbow, you'll attract rainbows. And that just stood out to me because like diversity isn't something that you can invest in at 250 people. Like you need to make it a priority so that you don't feel like the, like we've been there being the only woman on the floor. I don't want to recreate that for the next generation of sales professionals to join our team. And so like, there's a point in time where like, yes, everyone shares accountability, but like, it does need to start at the very top or someone needs to take that stand. And it's not like a gray, hey, let's try and hire more women. Like, let's try and, no. Like we made a priority, like the next person we hire is a woman. And to your point, Jill, maybe we'll have to compromise. I don't think we will. Like, I think if we yeah. actually make it a priority, if we actually set those standards, like we won't have to, and we'll be, you know, better off because of that. So my only stance is like, again, I am the person that I definitely feel that right now. Like, I wish I had better stats to share of our own team, but like, it's something that like I'm taking you know, responsibility for, and ultimately like it's a black or white, it's not a gray. There's, we will not hire another person on the team unless it's a woman on our account executive team. Right. And so I think that's where like, we need to nix the gray area in some of these mm -hmm. places and just say like, it's a black or white thing and like take it or leave it. Um, well, so. Lip service versus taking action, yeah. Yeah. but it's the same thing. Right. And, and I just want to challenge on the other side. So I'm, I'm going to think about this with what I see in, in the daily of I don't care that next hire is going to be a woman, love it, but make darn sure hiring managers that are here and executive leaders that your expectations are realistic with the market. So mm -hmm. if you start saying, I need somebody with 20 years of experience in this and this and this and this domain and that domain, guess what? You've just narrowed down your pool and it's only going to be men. And if that's what you need, then you've got to be okay with that. And you've got to create it somewhere else. And that is that is the hard truth of this. So I think it's, I, I talk about expectations versus reality all the time. I could want to be a size zero by tomorrow, but guess what? Not going to happen. And, and I think it's just, it's that. So it's like, if we have a commitment, what is the work and what really exists and how do we create it? If it's not here today, while we're dealing with what's here today. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that came in and Mel, you inspired this was, what Melanie shared really resonated with me. I'm in B2B sales for telco, sorry, I abbreviated it, which is a male dominated field. With that said, my mentors are male as well. Where did you find strong female mentors? So this is a hot topic just in the ecosystem. It could be man, it could be woman, it could be anybody. People are talking about mentors. And in my mind, an advisor is different than a mentor than is different than a coach. And mentorship, in my mind, is a really big deal. It takes a lot of time. It's a commitment for both parties. And I saw this on a clubhouse chat that I was doing. A woman showed up. And at the end, the man that I was having the conversation with, she's looking at his LinkedIn profile. And she says, I see you're open to mentorship. And he says, yes. And she goes, can I be your mentee? There's no context. There's no reason. There, It's just like showing up to throw up. I'm going to start this with, that's not what to do. <laughs> um, but let's flip the script here on what to do and how do you. And Mel, you said it earlier where you said, I was looking and I couldn't find anybody in SAS. And um, I love that you're trailblazing so that people can look to you. But how do we do a good job of finding strong female mentors and dot A or A dot whatever we're saying here, sub point? Um, how do we approach them? So somebody like you, Mel, that's really busy, 
how do I get your time? Do I get your time? If I don't get your time, what are some alternatives? And so Mel, because the person called you out, I'm going to start with you. And then Jill would love to hear this. And then we're probably going to be out of time. So time flies when we're having fun, but really good conversation here. Yeah. So I want to make sure that I'm as helpful as possible with my advice and like trying to take the whole like CEO looking for, you know, because I've got my whole other side of like mentorship needs where I went through that journey. So going back to where I was earlier in my career, um, I think like one thing that was, I think on a personal side, like a, I guess, strength that I had was that I wasn't afraid to like spark up conversations with people in the company that were like multiple levels up for me. Like you need know, it, like literally like in the kitchen. I know we're in a virtual world, but I swear I'm going somewhere with this, like in the kitchen, like leading up to the bathroom, like I just like went out of my way to like spark conversations with people so that like my work relationships like slowly develop over time. And so one of my mentors became our VP of sales. Like we couldn't be more different, but she was just like, she had 25 years of selling. I knew that, you know, she was someone that I would learn a lot from. And like, I, you know, it, it was very gradual. It wasn't like I walked up to her one day and, and honestly, like we didn't even discuss, like, I didn't say like, Hey, are you open to mentoring me? I will be honest there, but it was more so like, it just became that person that I went to for advice. And I'm like, Hey, can you grab coffee? I've got something I want to talk to. So I'll say first and foremost, like, I think like you can get mentorship without necessarily calling it mentor mentee by like going out of your way to build some of those relationships naturally. Two, I actually think that thanks to some community communities like MSP and there's others out there, there are actually like mentee mentor like programs in there. I think like Richard, you can speak more to this, but I know that there was a spreadsheet going around a while ago, which like you guys were collecting, like who's available to mentor, who's a bit like who wants mentorship. And so I think there's ways that you can seek that out. And I think if you're in a company, right. Um, if you're in a company that's big enough, like it's never too, too early to start that kind of program internally and just like have a Slack channel or have like a policy in our HR team. So I think like one, there's ways that from a structural standpoint, you can kind of facilitate that. Um, and then honestly, like I've been shameless. I've been that person, Amy, that did ask those questions, but I did to your point, address it differently, right? Like it wasn't just like, oh, well, Jill looks like she knows sales. Like I'm going to reach out to Jill. Like to me in the past, like I've listened to someone like on a podcast that like really stood out to me and like, you know, something that they said. And then like, I started doing research on them. Like I read out about them and just like, you'd like send like a really high quality prospect, a really personalized email. You know, the initial ask wasn't like, will you mentor me? It's just like, Hey, you know, I've been looking to learn more about this. Like it, it seems like a lot. I listen to your podcast. I mean, like, would you be open to spending 15, 20 minutes with me? And like, I'd say most of the time, if it's approached in the right way, where it feels personalized, it's not just like, hey, I'm looking for a mentor, you're good at sales, mentor me. You just kind of start that with like, kind of like dating, like walk, crawl, walk, run approach. Like, I think then finally, it's just like, hey, you've been a phenomenal mentor to me. I'd love to maintain this relationship if you're open to catching up every three months, right? I think it's really that approach to it that, that makes all the difference in terms of like actually getting the result. I agree. As my dear friend, Sam McKenna and another MSP -er would say, show me, you know me. And what you're talking about is exactly that. If you want my time, show me that you've earned it because you've invested time and you take it seriously. Jill, wow. round it out, sister, right. the mentorship front. Um, 10 minute warning, ladies, time flies. Like right. we're, we're taught, we knew this was going to happen. All we right. haven't even scratched the tip of the surface of what we're talking about. Um, but this is a good place to start. So Jill, mentorship, yeah. how, how so, you've done it, how it's done for you. Absolutely. Um, I seek out women to mentor in my existing companies. And they're usually um, those who are in the very early parts of their career or on a cusp. Um, I see them holding themselves back and they're on a cusp of being really great but something has to, you know, someone has to push them. And it may not, I typically don't do this of direct reports. They would be someone on my team, like a skip report or something like that. Or I've just been observing them in a meeting on another team. And I'm like, wow, they could be really good, but they need a little bit of guidance and help or a lot. And so I've done that in my job. And to me, that's very satisfying. That's one of the most satisfying things you can do. So I continue to do that. So that's like my, you know, go and seek someone out because 
it's it creates sanity for me in a world of insanity on a day to day day to day basis in sales. Um, but I also think if you know you're not sought out out by a senior person, um, you need to be thinking about you know I know there's other ways of thinking about just a board of advisors versus just one mentor, and think about people outside of your company. Think about an aunt or uncle who could be successful. Think about the retired person next door who was a lawyer, a female lawyer. And what did she get through to become a lawyer decades ago and retire, right? So there's just different things in different people out there um, who could give you such great guidance that may not be in your specific profession, but it applies to you with respect to business. So I think if you have this interesting board of people around you and in your head, um, it's the board or your brain trust, you, when you have an issue or a problem or a decision to make, you can say, hmm, should I talk to Sally about that? Or can, it doesn't always have to be a female, right? So, you know, think about who are these different people who um, inspire you or, could have had these amazing experiences that could contribute to your life today. And so it doesn't then seem like such a quote unquote drain on a mentor to spend time with you regularly. Well, and I, I, I will say this, I mentor three people, two women, one male, mm -hmm. and um, it is rewarding on the mentorship side to see how it's materializing to see how they apply it, right? So it's not just a drive-by. Mm -hmm. And the folks that I mentor, it happened organically. Nobody gave me a proposal. Yeah. It was just, <laughs> they showed up where I was. They were listening to what I was sharing. They shared with me what resonated and where they wanted to work. I've gotten plenty of person. This just happened a week ago where I got a video from three people. It was like, Somebody read a posting about this and now it's happening. And they're like, Amy, I love what you share. And I just want 20 minutes of your time to be like you. And while that's flattering to me, it doesn't give me any really reason why I need to spend time. And I hate to say that, but as female executives, time's not on our side. We have 24 hours in a day. That's it. It's finite. And it's our most treasured priceless thing that we can give and so if somebody's going out on a limb and Joe, I love your proactive mentorship you're like I'm seeing something I'm saying something I'm going to do something at the same time I love that but we get a real big charge and I think it's that stickiness of seeing it full circle and that's where I learned something new like wow you applied it that way I didn't think about that that's amazing so it is a two-way street um yeah. as we start winding things down, which makes me really sad because, you know, we didn't even get to the whole Reiki thing here of male energy, female energy. And I was, I was here for that ladies. Um, but that just gives us more to talk about in the future. I'd love to start winding this down with one thing that we didn't talk about that you really want to talk about that you would think is just such a great takeaway for those lovely gems that have joined us. Um, Jill, I'll start with you and then Mel, if we can round it out with you. I think that's a great way to say thank you for spending time with us. And we hope that this has been helpful. And here's one final tidbit of fire. <laughs> All right. Um, so don't bite your tongue, right? We Far too long, we bite our tongues. Um, we're brought up as girls and women to kind of play nice. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to be mean, but speak up. Mel, what, what's on, what's on your mind over there? Okay. Um, there, this is like a slightly touchy subject, but I think it's worth mentioning because I would assume other people have felt this way too. Um, I think one of the things as a, and I think this applies to any age, but especially as a younger sales professional in your career is that, for example, when I go to a conference, um, and I was like at the booth, right. It's very common that you go to the conference and then you do the happy hour, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you're at a conference and you're selling, you're likely trying to, like, if you hit it off with a prospect in the conversation, you're like, oh my gosh, this is going somewhere. Like, I think this is a real buyer, right? If you're two men, the totally normal thing to do in that situation would be like, hey, 
let's go to dinner. Let's go grab, like, let's go grab whiskey after this. Like, let's go do something. And like, because you don't want to lose that chance to talk to that prospect where you guys are hitting it off. That becomes a lot less easy to do and less comfortable because of societal norms. If it's a woman to male dynamic, right? Like, Hey, you want to go get a whiskey afterwards? Want to go to dinner after this? Because the reality is that there's social connotations there that are uncomfortable. Um, so I think like, and, and there's different situations. Like I've been in situations where like I took my customer, right? We have a phenomenal relationship out to a nice steak dinner when I went to, to DC and the waitress brings him the check because that's the natural thing to do. So he brings him the check and then like, I have to do the whole, like, it's not you, it's me. Let me pay for it. You know? And, and these are just like those small uncomfortable situations that I think like, we just don't talk a lot about in terms of the context of being a woman in sales. And so I think like, if you're a man in that situation, right. And you see that, like, you're talking to a woman at a conference, it is truly like a sales discussion. You're genuinely interested in what they have to say and the product or the service. You know, I think a way of kind of breaking the ice and making and removing any sort of like misconstruction is just like, Hey, I am really interested in what you have to say in this product. Like, why don't we continue the conversation over this? And like, you know, if you can lead that, it can remove a little bit of that context of like, well, I don't want to like ask to go to whiskey because what if it's misinterpreted? And so again, I know it's a very touchy subject and I don't know if I'm explaining it the best way, but I think if you're a woman in sales, you've probably been there. Like it's just uncomfortable. Even if you have malintention and the majority of the time your prospect doesn't, it's just an uncomfortable situation. So I think that there's ways that the men in that situation can kind of facilitate that happening in a way that's completely professional and not personal um, to kind of break that ice. And there's some tips and tricks as a woman. Now, I always call the restaurant ahead of time and under special instructions, I literally say, this is a business dinner, <laughs> bring me the check so that it's not like, are you guys here for a special occasion? Right? Because that's awkward, right? So there's like little things that you can do and maybe I'll, I'll write a post, but those are some of the things that, again, I don't think are talked about enough that bring that certain level of like uncomfortability or discomfort or whatever the word is in those kinds of situations. That's the fire that I wanted to end this with. And I will say as a person that's been in enterprise sales for years and years and years, here's the thing. Um, I have been to many conferences. I have had many of those moments. And what I found as a trick for me, so I love you're calling the restaurant ahead of time. I planned ahead of time. So I knew who was gonna be there. I would plan a group dinner and make it very methodical of, I'm going to have 10 seats. I'm going to pay for it ahead of time. We're going to have a special room. These are the things. So none of it is even questioned and I get to decide. The other thing here is um, we didn't even talk about this, but there is some girl on girl crime, especially as you're rising up the ranks. Uh, this is where ladies can come together to say, Hey, do you want to host a dinner together? Because I have seen this firsthand where I am having dinner with a group of men and all of a sudden there's like rumor behind the scenes that I'm doing some personal favors to get the business. No, no, I'm not. So that's a different story for a different day of, you know, women to women, we get threatened sometimes by each other and our egos take over and then we hold each other down. I'm going to leave us with that little snack to talk about for next time. But Mel, I love that you talked about that because events, even though we're in a pandemic, they will come back and these will be things. And there are horrible assumptions made um, that we can kind of run a proactive play on versus being in the moment and being like, oh my gosh, what do I do? So ladies, my newfound spirit animals, we, I just, adore both of you. I respect both of you. I am glad that both of you are in the community and that you're using your voices. And this was a real treat. I've learned from both of you. And I hope everybody that's joined us today has learned from both of you. So better together, ladies, better together. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Thank Mom. you. Yeah, that was, that was an amazing, amazing conversation. Thank you all. Uh, you're all incredibly busy. Got a lot going on. I appreciate you taking some time to have some pre- awesome and candid conversation with the community. Amy, thank you for moderating. Jill and Mel, thank you for joining us on the panel. For those who are interested, uh, MSP does have a number of initiatives that we have around diversity, equality, and inclusion. If you'd like to get more involved in helping shape programs like this, 
the, the information about the DEI committee is in the chat panel. And if you're a revenue leader and you want resources to figure out what questions to ask, some of the tools that we mentioned here today and others, we do have an entire page of DEI resources for revenue leaders. Feel free to take a look at that. Um, but Amy, Jill, Mel, thank you so much for the candor and the candid conversation here today. It was phenomenal. Uh, and thank you so, so much. Stay safe and have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.